This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. So this drops on Thursday, July 1st, which is Canada Day, Canada's birthday. So happy Canada Day to all Canadians. Very nice. And I'm wearing my red shirt, my red golf shirt. Pause it for the last time ever. I'm not a big fan of the shirt, but it's red. I don't think I've worn a golf shirt in in over a year. I haven't golfed in over a year. Can you believe this heat? Like We were just talking earlier about how hot it is in Ottawa, but we set a record in Canada yesterday in Lytton, BC at 46.1 degrees Celsius. It's unreal. We're 33, 34 here today in Ottawa, which is very hot for us. We have high humidity, but 46. I mean, all through the Pacific Northwest, the temperatures have been unbelievable in in the mid 40s. Yeah. Scary stuff. It's It's a good thing that in in today's episode, I mean, maybe not a good thing, but we, we will talk about climate change. So if that's if that's related to these temperatures, then uh, we'll, we'll give some give people some things to think about. I have a show for you. Don't know if you've been, uh, if you watch the, the Jeffrey Epstein uh, series, but there's a new series that follows up on that called Epstein Shadow, uh, just Len Maxwell, and it's on Crave. It's a three-part uh, series. Very interesting, uh, horrible story, obviously. And she, she's in custody now in the U.S., but it gets into her background and the story of, of her, her family's uh, fortune and what happened to her father, then how she ended up in the U.S. and meeting uh, Jeffrey Epstein. So it's a pretty pretty wild uh, add-on story to the Jeffrey Epstein story, if anyone's interested in that, on Crave in Canada. I don't know how you always have shows that you've reviewed and watched and, and can recommend and insights from books. Blows my mind. You do just as much content and you've got... Young children. Yeah, I guess so. You crank all these papers out. I'm not cranking out the papers you are. <laughs> Says the guy with the new bookshelf behind him that's loaded with books. You know, I was well, I was putting those books away because I'm, I'm I've moved into our in our new house, and I, I noticed that every time I would grab a handful of books from the box and put them on the shelf, I don't think that there was one handful that I grabbed where at least one of the books was not authored by uh, somebody who's been on our podcast. Oh, wow. I thought that was pretty cool. I was talking to Angelica last week. She got her new Kindle. And uh, I, I love my Kindle. So instead of having a bookshelf, I'd have like a little Kindle sitting behind me. <laughs> so few books left in the house. That's probably more efficient. It is nice to be able to grab a book and find the dog ears and notes and stuff like that, though. That's the hard part. Which books do you want to keep and go back and reread? Mm. having the actual book is much easier to do that. So the move went okay? Yeah, as far as moves go, I mean, uh, not not too bad. Not a fan of moving. Wouldn't uh, wouldn't do it again anytime soon. But uh, yeah, we're, we're in here now. Um, we don't have a kitchen because it's being redone. <laughs> so, I mean, we have a, a makeshift kitchen, but, you know, it's all right. So we talked about uh, rent versus buy a couple of weeks ago, and boy, does that ever bring other comments on YouTube? Yep, yep. I think the somebody actually made this comment in the Rational Minder community that that he, the uh, there there's a, a moral judgment that owning your home is a good thing, and that's another one of those things that can get very uh, difficult to have a civilized conversation about because of that, because some people believe that owning a home is a good thing that everybody should strive for which not everybody agrees with so it can lead to heated discussion so in that conversation some people were asking that we do time stamping any news on that uh i don't have any news but i it's something that angelica is aware of and uh, yeah it's something that we're working on i think it's it's time consuming uh because you have to go through and someone has to go through and watch it to do the timestamps. Um, so it's something that Angelica is trying to work into the post-production processes. Right. And the time between recording and releasing is pretty tight, I think for that. So maybe for sure. Yeah. Yeah. To, to get the episodes out on, we, we, we record on Mondays to get it out on Thursdays. 
And the latest yeah. on the West Gray video coming out that was recorded a few weeks ago in the community. Yep. So we had the live event with Wes uh, that went very well for, for anybody that uh, that attended. It was a lot of fun. I think it was fun for you and I, Cameron, to be sort of engaging with people in the in the comments while also talking to Wes. Uh, so that was very cool. And yeah, the the video, the full video um, with a bit of edits. Like there was a time Wes had to get up to answer the door. We we cut that out, but. <laughs> for, for, for the most part, unedited. It's like an hour and 45 minutes long. That is up in the community. You can access it. And then we're going to release it on our public YouTube channel for anybody to see um, next week. Yeah, it's a really fun watch. And we're also going to actually, speaking of timestamps, that one does have timestamps, which is great because it's so long. Um, but the other thing that we're going to do is create individual videos for a lot of those timestamps because there are a lot of, Wes says I'm, here's the question and then he answers the question mm -hmm. and we think that that could make a lot of good individual video clips. It's a great idea. Coming up next week is Rob Arnott from Research Affiliates and then two weeks after that, Bill Schulteis, the author of Coffee House Investor Ground Rules, which is a great book we've mentioned a couple times. And then two weeks after that is Katie Milkman is coming on. She wrote the book, How to Change, that we reviewed a few weeks ago. So three phenomenal guests. We also have guests booked up pretty much through January now, I think. We have an amazing mm -hmm. lineup coming up. Uh, sales in the store have been slowing a little bit. So we have lots of hoodies and shirts and mugs and stuff in stock. So maybe we'll do a summer sale at some point, maybe talk to Angelica about that, but it's not like the stuff's very expensive and free shipping in North America. And, and we don't make any spread on it. Just barely enough to cover packaging and shipping. Um, some interesting and very kind reviews people left uh, for us. One was a senior student interested in research and machine learning said that he and his peers enjoy the academically f influenced approach that we take to content creation. Much love from Toronto. That's from M. Brotos. Uh, James says, keep it up guys. It instantly goes to the top of my podcast list every Thursday. We hear that from a lot of people on, on Thursdays. And then here's another person said, listening to the podcast on Thursdays become their ritual. Helps me calm down from all the crazy stuff that is going on in the markets and to stay the course with my financial planning. Each episode is like a new piece of the puzzle that makes the overall picture more clear. Thank you. You guys do a fantastic job. That's Zalupa228. So that's kind of the point to be able to relax with all the crazy stuff going on. That's exactly the point, yeah. Anything else to add? No, well, th those were very kind reviews and we always appreciate getting them. We, we read all of them. And as far as we know, it helps other people find, uh, find the show. So uh, anybody that's enjoying listening, uh, feel free to write us a review. One of the people that wrote those reviews you just mentioned, um, I think, or maybe it wasn't in here. I saw somebody that said that they, they waited until they'd listened to every single podcast before writing the review. <laughs> I thought that was, oh, that yeah. was pretty cool. That's some serious due diligence, but mu much appreciated from us. But I must say, the guests we've had on, like I, I've started now to go back and listen to prior guests. And they're, the guests are awesome. I haven't listened to any of the, what we call the us episodes, just you and I yet. But I go back and listen to the guests now. I try to listen to one or two every week. Do you know the top three episodes? This is a cool stat. Top three episodes are us episodes. I know. Number four is Ken French. Incredible. And Andrew Hallam is up there too, I think. Uh, he might have dropped down a bit. He was up, up there for a while. Yep. Anyway, point is, you sh maybe you should go back and listen to the Yas episodes, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, let's go to the main part of the episode. Welcome to episode 156 of the Rational Minor Podcast. And yes, another week, another book. This book was recommended by our good friend James who we enjoy meeting up, or I enjoy meeting up for coffee with. So he suggests that I read the book called Factfulness, 10 Reasons We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think by Hans Rosling. Have you read this book? No, I have not. It is really an uh, excellent, excellent book. It's, um, it's an engaging read that shows how most people's perception of our world are wrong. And he, he talks about how the world has experienced unbelievable progress for a very long time, 
but many people are not aware of that progress. And he highlights that there's many reasons for this, such as you know the basic news cycle shows much more negative news and positive news, and the news takes a snippet of reality and doesn't always give or have time to give long-term perspectives or pick up on the trends. And he also highlights the fact that many people beliefs and current beliefs around the world came from their training when they were in school, say 30, 40 years ago, and don't reflect mm. any sort of updating of knowledge. And it can also reflect our parents or our grandparents' views, but the subject matter that he asked people about are often anchored in information that's decades old. Wow. It's so interesting. Like, for example, he talks about a memory of himself. He grew up in Sweden and he almost drowned as a child in a sewage pool in the street and he lived in a working class part of sweden if you can believe it so his mother was ill with a very serious disease in the hospital father had to work a, a, a far away from home so his grandmother's watching him and just happened to catch him pull him out of this sewage pool and prevented him from drowning but this was very common when he was uh, being raised in the 40s so this happened quite often back then but it's basically been eliminated in, in that area since then so he went on to he gives his own life example. He went on to getting a great education, great health care. Um, he had a healthy family. He even presented at, at the economic summit in Davos once. And the big point of his book is that there are distribution curves everywhere, but often the news picks up on the tails as opposed to looking at the average situation and doesn't ever look at the average situation, how people's lives change over time. And he says, no matter what happens, there's always going to be the tails. The news will focus on the tails, but the tails are not the story. The middle is the story. The change in the majority of the population around the world should be the story. So a couple of examples. He talks about the richest 10% of the population in Brazil currently earns 41% of the total income. So that storyline might jump out, but there's no long-term context. He says, yes, that number is too high, but it's the lowest level it has been in years. For example, it was 50% in 1990. Another example he give, gives, so the population in the world has grown from a billion and a half people in 1900 to 6 billion in 2000. And most humans, when they hear that stat, will assume that the growth rate will just keep going straight up, but it doesn't. The UN expects a population to level out at about 11 billion in 100 years or so. But the increase in population is that middle group, the adults become a larger part of the population and the birth rate is slowing. So it ends up leveling out in about 100 years or so. Hmm. And he gives reasons for why that's happening. You, know, you don't have this great a need for children to support you because of you know, farming, things like that. Uh, also, kids live longer. And he talks about how you know, families have many children because often some would die quite young, right? Uh, there's better health care around the world. There's more sex education, more contraception. So for all these reasons, there's fewer and fewer kids being born. So he, one of the questions that comes up, he says, well, how do you fix these misconceptions about you know, population in the world? And he says, look at data. He said, look for trends. Don't just uh, digest the extreme. Think in levels. How is the average person in each of these levels shifted over time? Uh, be very aware of averages. He also talked about be aware of the view at the top. So he talks about how many people, for example, in North America, who, relatively wealthy societies can, can, he talks about as if you're the top of a building looking down at the people on the sidewalk. And he said, they look just like people. And he says, you may not be able to tell that their lives are getting better or not. But he said, there's tremendous improvement in living conditions among the people around the world. If you look at access to healthcare, to clean water. And he said, that may not be easy to, be easy to realize if you're in a typical North American situation. He says many people feel the world is getting worse. So he said when you ask someone the life expectancy of the average person in the world, more people get that question wrong than a random guess by a chimpanzee. Hmm. So he asked the question, do you think the average life expectancy is 50, 60, or 70? He said that the correct answer is, is 72. But he said most people get that question wrong. And he said the more educated the audience he asks it to, the worse the guess. It's incredible. 
Yeah, that is. So he cites examples uh, in the book that have improved over time, you know, fewer oil spills, lower HIV infections, cost of solar panels going down, leaded gasoline usage going down, literacy going up, scholarly articles published going up, electricity coverage going up. Uh, another neat stat he gives, guitars per million people has increased from 200 per million in 1962 to 11,000 per million in 2014. That is a very cool stat. How's that for a cool stat, right? So he says, you know, some people call him an optimist, but he he didn't feel great about that. He prefers to be called a possibilist, someone that neither hopes without reason nor fears without reason and constantly resists the overdramatic worldview. He sees progress and his conviction that further progress is inevitable, which I think is a pretty cool way to live your life. Interesting. So the world is getting better, but people don't realize it because they focus on the tails. Focus on the tails and they don't have the time and the news doesn't necessarily give you the broader context. So look for mm. trends. But the world is getting better. Yeah, the that is, is uh, very cool. On to recent news. Cool story I caught from the investment executive summarizing uh, comments that CRA gave at a recent conference. So if you have an over contribution in your tax-free savings account, you'll be subject to a penalty of 1% per month of the amount that you're over your limit. But the question was asked, what if your TFSA goes to zero? You completely blow it up in bad stock picking. Does the penalty stop? And the answer is no. You have to wait for a new room to show up in yeah. the coming years to soak that up. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, 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 I, I made that video on TFSAs a long time ago. I mean, relatively long time ago. That was one of the first videos on common sense investing that, that people actually watched. I talked about how the <laughs> taking r individual security risk in your TFSA is worse than doing it in your ta in your taxable account because you you don't get a capital loss and you can blow up your your room. But it, it the par part of the point was that you you use up contribution room by putting money in. You get it back the following year if you take money out. But if you put money in and the value of it goes to zero, you've used up the room. There's nothing left to withdraw. The room is gone forever. Yep. Yep. And now something from the, are you kidding me file? I wouldn't mind chatting with you about this. So, and, and arguably this should be in the bad advice of the week, but an article in RIA Biz, which is a trade publication entitled Wealthfront in its sixth pivot as a firm reduces its robo advisors role and puts decision-making power where it belongs with retail investors. I thought this was an incredible story. It's about Wealthfront, you know, the big robo advisor in the US is making a shift allowing their clients to make self-directed trades and crypto. So becoming much more like Robinhood, which I believe is gonna, they're expected to IPO later this summer with a potential valuation in the $40 billion range. And Wealthfront is five years older than Robinhood and is worth by some estimates only about a billion dollars. So is this a drive to make Wealthfront more valuable? But it's certainly a huge shift away from what they've always promoted and represented, which is you know modern portfolio theory, uh, you know efficient market hypothesis, Burton Malkiel, that whole narrative. Um, but what they're doing here is not that they're they're swapping out full portfolio management for clients who offer more control, and they're swapping in conscientious oversight. I guess is their value proposition for this. But what they've discovered is that. A lot of their clients have a lot of money held elsewhere. Like I think Wealthfront has about $25 billion of assets, but their clients have $50 billion elsewhere. Hmm. They'll, they'll be allowed to hold up to 20% of their portfolio in crypto. Interesting. I mean, it looks a lot like I'm not intimately familiar with uh, Wealth Simple's business model, but Wealth they were early. Wealth Simple. Oh, sorry. Okay. They, they, they were early to do a lot of this stuff, right? because they had the, the low fee indexing oh, yeah. model, but they added all sorts of other products as time marched along. So it's, you know, we, we were always skeptical of the business model of the super low fees and in, in, a, in what is often a fa fairly high service business, at least if you want to keep clients around, but 
well simples and and it sounds like well front now are, are making it work by adding other revenue streams which of course makes sense but i mean you put people in the seats by offering this low fee indexing thing which is was very attractive at the time and yeah i mean of course they have to tack on other services to make it a viable business it doesn't seem uh doesn't seem too surprising but, but to, to your point about this being potentially bad advice yes i, I <laughs> swapping in conscientious oversight you go from yeah. modern portfolio theory to swapping in conscientious oversight really yeah well it's a business right index funds are a commodity you can't sell a commodity and, and have a viable a viable business and and clearly consumers see what robin robin hood's value proposition is as a as a value add to their lives even though we would say it's detracting from their lives, but enough people see it as a value add that they're yeah. willing to pay. Well, willing to pay. They don't even, with Robinhood, I don't even think people realize that they are paying, right? Because of the way that they're making their their uh, profits. But but anyway, if you're not paying, you are the product. That's right. As we've said many times. Yeah. Okay, on to the investing topic. Yeah. So, like I like I mentioned in the introduction to the episode with the heat wave that we're going through this is maybe a timely topic to to talk about um climate change is a question that i i, I did a live event for for some europeans uh, a couple of weeks ago and then one of their questions was about uh climate change and on the same day i i got a question from one of our clients about climate change so i figured maybe it was a good time to dive into the dive into the topic and, and see what kind of research has been has been done. Um, I mentioned those two questions that I got, but I, I think that this is on the minds of, of a lot of of investors. Like we, we keep hearing, and it's kind of like the tales that you just talked about, Cameron, in the news cycle. We keep hearing about this, these really bad possible outcomes and, and how, how the climate is worsening more than expected and all that kind of stuff. Um, so investors worry that if things do get a lot worse from that perspective than a lot of businesses, but potentially businesses that investors own could have some serious troubles um and I, a, a lot of that ties back to fossil fuels as people know i don't probably don't even need to say that um but like you mentioned with progress cameron a lot of that's been related to at least or driven by uh by fossil fuels the, the huge surge in economic development over the last couple of hundred years has coincided with with uh energy from an energy use derived from burning fossil fuels. And one of the results of that has been the rising levels of carbon dioxide and, and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, and uh, an increase in the mean surface temperature of the earth. Scientists expect more temperature increases. Um, and the, the social, like you start digging into, someone sent me a video, I can't remember, what it was now, but it was, it was someone talking about like how, how this could go down potentially in terms of the social and economic impacts. And it, you know, you can paint a pretty scary picture and I'm not saying that's, that's the wrong picture to paint. It could be the right one. But the point is it's, it's it, a lot of, it's not good news related to climate change. Now from investors who are deciding today, knowing that the, these, these risks exist, investors who are deciding today to allocate their capital uh, the concern is that if you allocate capital to, for example, uh, businesses that rely on fossil fuels or produce fossil fuels, um, that you might end up taking a total loss or, or a big loss um, if the world moves to eliminate or, or reduce its dependence on, on fossil fuels uh, and, and other businesses that are, that are affected by climate change. Um, in the literature on climate change, there are two, two main risks, or the, the the two main risks are summarized as as physical risk. So that's that's um, businesses and communities being affected by things like changing weather patterns, um, previously habitable areas becoming uninhabitable. I, I that that video that I mentioned that I can't remember what it was now. Uh, they talked about some areas. I believe in Africa, if I remember correctly, where the, the heat and the humidity combined 
uh, and this is, I guess, in the in the in the relatively near future, this this is expected to happen, where the heat and humidity combined will make it so that people will just die in the heat because you get so hot, but because of the humidity, your sweat doesn't evaporate, and you just that's it. People people can't cannot survive in that in wow. that climate. So anyway, that would be a physical risk if a business was located in in that area. Um, then that, that doesn't uh, doesn't bode so well for their for their future. And then flooding is another example of uh, the physical risks of climate change. So physical risk, that's one uh, segment or, or categorization of risk. And then the other one is transitional risk. Uh, the transitional risk of climate change is the response of consumers and governments to climate change. Uh, you think about consumers demanding lower carbon. We've seen this. Uh, we've seen this lots. Consumers demanding lower carbon impact from products and services. Um, governments introducing regulations or taxes to reduce emissions. Both of those create pretty meaningful uncertainty for businesses. So that's the transitional risk. That's the the risk of a bad outcome for for business uh, for a business uh, as we transition to an environment where we're hopefully mit- mitigating the changing climate. So. From an asset pricing perspective, we know asset prices, stock prices, bond prices, um, they reflect expectations about future cash flows discounted at, at a rate reflecting their expected return. So riskier assets have a higher discount rate, higher expected return, safer assets, lower discount rate. Um, if you think about physical and transitional climate change risks, they're probably going to affect both of those, both of those components of asset prices. They're probably going to affect expected cash flows. Uh, and they're probably going to affect the discount rate. So you expect lower cash flows, you expect more risk, more uncertainty. Uh, so both of those together, or either one of them, I guess, on their own, puts downward pressure on asset prices. And then the other channel, separate from risk, uh, explicitly, that they can affect prices is the tastes of investors. So we've talked about this a few times uh, ourselves, and we've talked about it with Ken French, who authored the 2007 paper that introduced this idea with uh, with Gene Fama. That's uh, disagreements, t- disagreement tastes and asset prices, uh, and then that's just the idea that investors who are willing to own or not willing to own an asset for reasons unrelated to uh, to risk and expected return, uh, that they, they have a taste for that asset, and if enough investors in a group avoid allocating to the, to an asset or choose to allocate to an asset um, due to that preference, it can affect prices and expected returns. So if a lot of investors want to avoid owning an asset for re- reasons unrelated to risk, they can push down its price and up its discount rate, uh, even though it's not necessarily riskier. Right. So investor tastes can be another big mechanism that affects the discount rate, which again affects prices. So for carbon intensive, fossil fuel intensive firms, a lot of investors, and this is we've seen this through the growth in, in ESG investing, a lot of investors just don't want to own those companies separate from any reasons related to risk, and that can cause their prices to decrease. Um, there's a 2020 paper from Lubosch Pastor, who of course we had as a guest on the podcast, and we talked about this paper with him, uh, sustainable investing in equilibrium. And he applied this concept of tastes uh, for green assets. So green in, in his paper are uh, firms that generate positive externalities for society. And brown firms is what he uses as the opposite of, of green firms. They, they generate negative externalities. So in, in Lubosch's model, uh, investors prefer to own green assets, which leads them to accept a lower expected return. Uh, and in, in the model, it's also implied that green assets have lower expected returns because they hedge climate risk. And this one's really interesting. So there's a taste, there's a taste channel, and there's a climate risk hedge. And I'll explain what that what that means. Uh, if there's an unexpected worsening of the climate, consumers may exhibit greater demands for the green goods and services uh, that we mentioned earlier. Government regulation could push the demands even further or I guess that's different from demands maybe, but they could uh, increase hmm. that that effect even further. Uh, in, investors' taste for green assets could get stronger if, if the climate worsens uh, faster than expected. Uh, and and there's a decreasing 
uh, all, all of those combine to decrease the cost of capital for green firms. So if the climate gets worse than expected, green firms theoretically act as a hedge and therefore have lower expected returns because they're not exposed or they're, they're a hedge for that specific type of, type of risk. I, I think that, that piece is pretty cool. Does that make sense, the climate hedging part? But they, they could have in the near term higher unexpected returns as their cost of capital reduces. The, correct. So that, that's if, if the climate unexpectedly worsens. The demand for that hedge, the taste of that hedge increases, raises the near term unexpected higher returns, which Ken that's French right. talked a lot about unexpected portion of the total return. But that would leave the companies having lower cost of capital on the other side, which you would want and which would give you a, another personal or emotional dividend, right? Because those companies making a positive difference at a lower cost of capital, right? Lower expect return, but they're going to have a greater impact on the world. Yeah, and that, that is, it, it is all, a, it's a bit of a flywheel that can happen there, but who's, who's footing the bill? It's the investors owning the lower expected returning assets because of the positive externalities. Um, but you're, you're not, you don't get to, you don't get to stick that, those externalities in your, in your bank account. Um, and that's one of the trade-offs. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to prefer to own green assets. Um, anyway, so green firms theoretically benefit from an unexpectedly worsening climate, which makes them safer to own with respect to climate risk specifically. Uh, and, and in theory, again, they, they have lower expected returns for the two big reasons, which is the taste. Investors want to own them regardless of risk and expected return and because they're a hedge for climate risk. Now, that was does this also, does this also assume that the brown firms don't improve? Uh, that's a good question. Presumably the brown firms would want to improve because their cost of capital would decrease if they were to do so. Yeah, uh, but but I am going to touch on that a little bit more once we've covered some of the empirical stuff. So that was all theory that we just talked about the tastes and preferences and hedging climate risk from Lubosch, Pastor. Um, but the big question that we have to ask is: Okay, that's cool in theory, but what what does the empirical literature say on whether climate risk is actually priced? Because if it's not priced, uh, then then I guess none of the none of the theory really applies. If it is priced, then we would expect green assets to have uh, higher prices and lower expected returns than brown assets, uh, and we would expect if the climate deteriorates as expected, because everyone is kind of on the same page at this point that the climate's worsening. That's no that's no secret. Uh, so if the climate deteriorates as expected not worse than expected, green assets should realize, all else equal, lower returns than brown assets. All else equals a big statement because like you said, Ken, Ken French described to us that the unexpected return dominates the outcome, but we're, we're talking about expectations for now. Uh, if the climate deteriorates more than expected, then the hedging property of the green assets would become valuable. And we, we've maybe even seen some of that where last year, for example, um, green, green assets did exceptionally, exceptionally well. Um, so you can look at that and say, wow, I want to own those because they did well last year. Or you can look at those and let, let and say, wow, though the expected returns on those assets are really low yeah. after their prices shot up. Um, now overweighting green assets with the hope of profiting from their hedging property would be an active bet against market prices. Because in that case, we're saying, um, okay, so climate change is climate risk is priced, but I think it's I think climate risk is is greater than what the market is pricing in. Therefore, I'm going to bet against market prices, overweight green assets with the expectation of profiting, which interestingly is, and I hope I'm not mischaracterizing the argument, but I believe that's the argument that Tim Nash, the sustainable economist, made when he was on our podcast that that it is a mispricing. Um, so, so some people will make that, uh, that argument. Uh, I would say that like most predictive, predictive uh, actions in the stock market, the, the payoff is going to be questionable. Uh, markets are pretty good, as, as we tend to talk about, pretty good at processing information. Uh, and and they, 
they, they align incentives in a way that makes investors want to do everything that they can to be the first to bring new information to the market. Uh, and, and aggregating all of the investors competing to do that makes it a pretty tough game to, to win if you're one of the investors that's trying to, trying to do it. Uh, so to, to address that empirical question though, that the question of is climate risk priced, I was able to dig up a ton of really interesting papers that take a bunch of really uh, uh, creative angles on answering the, the question. So you say for, I read a lot? Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> point made. Yeah, that's fair. I take your point. <laughs> uh, I have not read these papers. <laughs> that's fair. The point, the, the point is taken. I won't bring it up again. <laughs> <laughs> I just sit on the front porch, Oscar and I, every morning. We get an hour outside in the front porch. He has his treat. I have my book. We're all happy. Oh, that does sound very nice. Uh, okay, so for f the pricing of physical risk, uh, there's a 2019 paper, uh, Market Expectations About Climate Change, by Wolfram Schlenker and Charles Taylor. Uh, and they looked at whether futures contracts traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange between 2002 and 2019 and they found that over their observation period, the predictions of climate models, uh, warming trends inferred from futures prices. So climate models, the warming trends inferred from traded futures pr prices and observed, observed temperature changes, they all coincided. So the models, the implied, uh, the, the implications from futures prices and the realized temperature change all coincided over their observation wow. period. Uh, so the, the, the scientists, the climate scientists making the predictions through the, through the models and market participants had similar expectations. And over this period, those expectations ended up lining up with, uh, with reality. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, another one that took a, this is one of the pretty creative angles, I think. They, they looked at the municipal bond market. If you think about it, municipalities are this interesting laboratory because they can't relocate. A mun municipality can't get up and move because <laughs> they, they are their geography. <laughs> um, so the, the, the hypothesis in the paper is that municipalities with more exposure to climate risk through flooding or, or uh, weather pattern changes or whatever uh, have a higher cost of, of capital. That's the hypothesis. Uh, it's really interesting. Yeah. So it's a 2020 study by Marcus Painter, uh, an inconvenient cost, the effects of climate change on municipal bonds. They find that higher exposure to sea level rise is associated with higher municipal bond yields. Fascinating, right? And it's mostly wow. driven by longer maturity bonds, which suggests that investors are pricing long-term expected effects of climate change. And then another good one is a real estate market, similar to municipalities. You can't move real estate. Uh, so the 2019 study by Bernstein, Gustafsson, and Lewis, uh, Disaster on the Horizon, the Price Effect of Sea Level Rise. They find that houses exposed to sea level rise sell at a 7% discount to comparable properties that are not exposed to the same risk. Most of the discount is driven by houses not at risk of being flooded for another 50 years or projected to be flooded for 50 years. Uh, again, suggesting that investors are taking a long-term view of climate risk. They find a smaller 4% discount in prices among properties that are not projected to be flooded for, uh, for 100 years. So for, for the longer-term view, the, the discount is smaller. They found that the discount has grown over time, uh, and it's driven by sophisticated buyers and by communities worried about global warming. Uh, and this, is a, this, this piece is a real kicker for me. Uh, they, they found no relation between sea level rise exposure and rental rates, which reinforces the idea that the pricing discount is due to expectations about future damage and not the current quality of the property. Hmm. How fascinating is that? Wow. Yeah. So I thought that was, th those were, those were pretty cool for pricing the physical risk of climate change for transitional risk. Uh, there's a 2015 paper science and the stock market investors recognition of unburnable carbon. And in that paper, the authors find that the stock prices of the 63 largest U.S. oil and gas energy firms fell by 1.5 to 2% after the publication of a landmark paper in the journal Nature 
Uh, and, and that paper argued that most fossil fuel reserves would need to remain untouched in order to keep warming under two degrees by 2050. The finding of that paper, of the paper in Nature, implied that fossil fuel reserves could become worthless if aggressive regulations to combat climate change were put in place. Now, the interesting thing in this paper is that they found that markets reacted to the findings of the paper three days after it was published, even though the media didn't pick it up until much later, like three years later. So this paper mm-hmm. comes out in the journal Nature saying um, we, we can't touch fossil fuel reserves if we want to keep warming under two degrees. And within three days, the prices of the 63 largest U.S. oil and gas firms fell by 1.5 to 2%. Thought that was pretty good. Pretty good evidence. Um, Amazing. Another one, 2015, 2015 paper, Environmental Externalities and the Cost of, ca- uh, and cost of Capital by Shava. Uh, they found that investors demand significantly higher expected returns on stocks that are excluded by uh, environmental screens, such as hazardous, hazardous chemicals, substantial emissions, and climate change con- uh, concerns compared to firms without such concerns. So higher, higher cost of capital, which is what the models uh, from Lubosch would, would predict. And Shava also finds that lenders charge a significantly higher interest rate on bank loans issued to firms with those environmental concerns, and they've got lower institutional ownership in the options market, and this one again is some of these papers you 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 read the findings and it's just like wow that is that is so cool. Just thinking of the question to ask and then being able to answer it is uh, it's impressive. Like you said, the world getting better with the amount of papers that are available now. It's just unbelievable. If you want to learn about something, the insight that's available. Anyway, getting off track. Uh, so in the options market, uh, Ilhan Sotner and Vilkov found in their 2021 paper carbon tail risk that uncertainty related to the future cl- to future climate policy, uh, uncertainty related to the future climate policy needed to combat climate change is priced. So they're hmm. looking at uh, looking at the options market. Uh, they found that the cost of downside protection, downside tail risk protection, is larger for firms with more carbon intensive business models. And the cost of downside tail risk protection is magnified for those firms at times when the public's attention to climate change spikes. Crazy, right? So if you want to protect the downside of a stock, it's more expensive to do it if it's a carbon intensive firm and even more so when the public's attention is on climate change. Uh, then I got a 2020 paper, Climate Regulatory Risks and Corporate Bonds by Seltzer, Starks and Zhu. Uh, they found that firms with poor environmental profiles or high carbon footprints tend to have lower credit ratings and higher yield spreads, particularly when they're located in a state with stricter regulatory enforcement. And they used in this paper, uh, they, they used the Paris Agreement as a shock to expected climate regulations. And the shocks like that can be used to uh, used as evidence of a causal relationship. Uh, so they they did that. Um, They used the Paris Agreement to show a causal relationship between climate regulatory risks and bond credit ratings and yield spreads and changes in the composition of institutional ownership for firms. So that was a lot of literature. I hope people aren't bored. Probably probably the opposite, knowing our (laughs) listeners. Um, But based on that, based on those those papers and their findings, I'm pretty comfortable saying that climate risk is priced and I think that should be reassuring for investors for a couple of reasons. If prices reflect current climate risks, investors are expecting returns commensurate with the risk that they're taking. It's not some you know black swan risk that you're not getting compensated for. Um, your, your expected returns are reflecting the risk that you're taking uh, due, due to climate change. If you wanna protect yourself from that risk, if you say, okay, cool, it's compensated, but I don't want to take that risk or, or it's compensated, but, but, I, but I don't think it's priced properly. It's mispriced. Okay, so then you own green firms. You own ESG uh, funds that align with your views and values or, or whatever. Um, and, and those green firms will be a hedge uh, or they're, they're expected to be a hedge anyway but the hedging property comes at the cost of lower expected returns. That's unescapable. Uh, even if you get high realized returns, all that's doing is pushing down your expected returns more. Going forward. Uh, 
right, going forward. Um, I, I also think that the evidence of climate risks being priced is good news for the world because it suggests that there really is a cost of capital incentive for firms to manage their exposure to climate risks. Now, I, I'm sure at this point that many of our seasoned listeners and maybe our new listeners too are, are thinking, well, hey, if climate risk is priced, maybe we should be building portfolios that load more heavily on carbon intensive firms <laughs> to increase our expected returns. We'll build a concentrated carbon intensive portfolio. The brown that factor. Is, yeah, the carbon, the carbon factor. That, that is the obvious follow-up question. At least it's the obvious follow-up question if you've been listening to our podcast for any, any amount of time. If, if climate risk is a unique source of priced risk, then loading more heavily to it could make sense. But it leads us to another empirical question, which has to be answered before pursuing that type of strategy, which is, does climate risk tell us anything more about expected returns that other known risk factors uh, don't, don't tell us? So we take factors like size, company size, relative price, um, and profitability. Those are all very well-known factors. If exposure to climate risk produces an alpha uh, after controlling for those factors, then hey, may maybe there is some, some excess return to be had. Uh, I was able to find a 2020 paper um, by Wade Day and Philip Meyer Bronze, uh, Greenhouse Gas Emissions and Expected Returns. And they looked at data for U.S., developed ex-U.S. and emerging markets from 2009 to 2018 for for evidence and uh, they found that measures of emissions had no reliable effect on returns after controlling for firm size relative price and profitability for stocks and forward rates for bonds and they found that cross-sectional differences in greenhouse emissions uh, greenhouse gas emissions failed to predict cross-sectional differences in future profitability once current profitability is controlled for so they're talking mm. about those two different mechanisms that can affect prices, the discount rate and uh, expected cash flows and using profitability as the uh, cur current profitability as the predictor for future profitability. Uh, if you add in uh, gr greenhouse gas emissions, you don't get any better predictive power for future profitability. Uh, so th their findings suggest that the impact of climate change on the expected returns of high emis emissions firms is already well captured by existing prices and proxies for expected future cash flows. So I, I know that news may be disappointing to some people that were ready to, to load up on carbon intensive firms, but I also don't think it should be surprising. Uh, like, like I mentioned before, the market's, uh, the market's a pretty difficult opponent to, to beat in an asset pricing competition. And even though our models for understanding how the market prices assets are imperfect, which is true for any model, it's not because we have bad models, it's just they're, they're, they're models, they're, they're imperfect. Uh, the models we have are pretty good. I mean, you take the, you take the Fama French five-factor model, uh, it explains the majority of differences in returns between diversified portfolios. And uh, as we just heard um, from that paper, it, it, it's, it's no exception if we're talking about portfolios constructed based on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, yeah, so I I if you're hoping to increase expected returns by tilting toward riskier assets with, with priced risks, then the, the, the good old size uh, value and profitability tilts are still probably the way to go. Uh, they, they seem to subsume any priced risks for uh, climate specifically. Now, there's one idea that I want to leave everybody with. Uh, we, we talked about the, the cost of capital incentive for companies to reduce their exposure to climate risk. Now, you take green companies, companies with low exposure to climate risk. Um, they've got lower expected returns because investors want to own them and because they offer a, uh, a hedge against climate risk. Their higher prices reflect that. They reflect their hedging capacity and they reflect their uh, the, the, the taste that investors have to own them. So if you say, I, I want to I make the world a better place, uh, so I'm only going to invest in green companies, that means expecting 
lower returns. Now, the other companies, the ones that we're not going to call green, the brown companies, they have higher expected returns because they're more exposed to climate risk and because investors don't want to own them. But the other piece of this is what you mentioned earlier, Cameron, that if companies turn greener over time, their cost of capital should decrease and their expected cash flow should increase, which increases their price. Now, why would bad, evil companies want to turn green? We don't even have to make a moral argument here. They want a lower cost of capital. If companies want a lower cost of capital, then they have to mitigate their exposure to climate risk. Exactly. So, you know, and incentives are, are, are kind of funny like that. Um, I, I think as an investor, it might not feel good to own green companies. Or sorry, it might feel good to own green companies uh, and, and be okay with accept, ex, accepting lower expected returns for doing so. But I kind of like the idea, and, and Wes Gray mentioned this when we, we had our, our live webinar discussion with him. I kind of like the idea of owning less green companies and not, not targeting them because we just talked about that's not necessarily going to give you a benefit, uh, but owning the less green companies and participating in their transition toward being greener. Now, I'm not suggesting that all companies are going to turn around and become green. Uh, and or, or align with with each in, in investor's values, but I, I think the the initiatives from asset managers like Vanguard and BlackRock, who have such concentrated power at this point because of their scale, they've been exercising that power through engagement with companies and proxy voting, with the views of managing climate risk. Now, it's also interesting to note that this isn't just Vanguard and BlackRock catering to what's hot. They're not just doing this to, to look uh, attractive to investors. I'm sure that's that plays a role. But if you look through their stewardship reports, their their statements say that they're, and, and Dimensional takes a similar position, but their statements say that they're, they're fiduciaries, which they are, and their clients are exposed to climate risk because they fully acknowledge the science of, of climate change and the transitional and physical risks that, that could materialize. And in their, in their role as fiduciaries, they are required to engage with companies that are most exposed to climate risk. And they report on very transparently their records of engagement and proxy votes. Uh, BlackRock even provides case studies of how they've engaged with companies and what the impact has been. So, I mean, that's a, if you own the brown companies, and put pressure on them, even if, you know, I, I can't do anything to put pressure on an oil and gas company, but BlackRock or Vanguard can, and they are, they are doing it. Um, and I think investors in aggregate have, have and just that the world at large has, has voiced its view that climate change is a real risk and things are going to need to happen to mitigate it. Yep. Uh, so owning those brown companies and holding them through to their transition to being greener is, is I, I would argue a better way to, you know, do well by doing good than owning just the green firms. Um, so that's the that's the thought I want to leave everybody with. Own, owning the brown firms and seeing them through to their greener futures may be a better way to uh, to change the world than ignoring the brown firms and saying I'm just going to own the green ones. And that's a very counterintuitive position to take. Yeah. So anyway, that's it. I, I, I think climate risk cool. is, is real, uh, but it's priced. So as investors, we don't need to, you don't need to do anything special unless you want to take the active position that it's priced incorrectly. And then maybe you want to hedge by owning green firms. But otherwise, I think that as much as it is a risk, and, and I agree that it is, it's a priced risk. And we as investors are being compensated for, for taking it. And even though it is priced, it's it's uh, subsumed by other known risk factors. So targeting it on its own wouldn't make sense because you'd end up with a less diversified uh, proxy for the other known risk factors. So it's kind of, you know, I guess as usual, people may get bored eventually. We conclude with the same thing. <laughs> uh, but that's it. Okay, that was awesome. On to talking sense. Those great cards from the University of Chicago Financial Education Initiative. Where are we at with our Talking Sense cards? 
coming. Angelica says they're coming. I think she talked to them last week, so they should be in the store hopefully soon. We'll let you know as soon as they get here. Ooh, here's a good one. How are the financial needs of a 10-year-old and a 65-year-old different? How are the financial needs of a 10-year-old and a 65-year-old different? Wow. You usually go first. So you I go. know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, what comes to mind? I mean, there's things like, I mean, money gives you freedom. Money gives you control. I remember when I was 10, dreaming of a stereo. We used to go to Eaton's every Friday night. I used to see the stereo every Friday night when I was 10 years old. And on my little worm business, I dreamed of saving up for this stereo. And I saved and saved and saved. So I learned the, the power of compounding and the and planning at that young age to go and buy a completely crazy consumer item. But still, I learned the lesson of, of the power of what money can give you. Is that different though than a 65 year old who's at the end of your savings career? I think you just hit the nail on the head. I think that's, that's the way that I would answer this question. The financial needs are different because the value of the human capital of the 65 year old is say it's zero. And the, the, the human capital value of the 10-year-old is astronomical, potentially. L wide range of outcomes, I guess. Um, that's the, I would say the needs are different because the 65-year-old is less likely to be able to earn income. Well, maybe that's not true, but they're... But then, say, say 65 coincides with retirement. They're, they're less likely to earn income. But the needs of a 65-year-old are much more important because you don't have as great a room for error. Yeah, I think that I think that's related to the human capital piece. I think that the 10 year old has lots yeah. of room to make mistakes and earn and the 65 year old uh, doesn't. They've they've done their earning and they're now reliant on but financial. But it's just as important for a 10 year old to learn the good lessons. Something as simple as compounding. I can remember being on my paper route. Maybe I've told this story on the podcast. I remember being on my paper route discovering the rule of 72, just going between houses on Clough Street in my hometown of Lenoxville. And I remember just like 10%. So I remember doing the simple math of $100, would be 107, that'd become like whatever, 115 would become 123. Like how many years does it take to double, right? Hmm. Yeah, I don't think you have told that story. That's, that's a cool story. It, it, I, I can vividly remember it was a snowstorm delivering the Montreal Gazette in Lenoxville. And it's a very steep part of the hill. I can remember Wow, I could double my money in whatever it was, seven or eight years back then. And that was just using interest rates. I used to go down to the bank, a little kid, and buy my Canada Savings Bond. Like, you, I bet you've never even owned a Canada Savings Bond. I have not. <clears throat> but back in the day, yes, I sound incredibly old, you used to go into the bank and buy your savings bond, and you could get annual pay or compounding. And so I bought the compounding because you just leave it there and show up, whatever it was, eight years later or something, and your $1,000 would be... $2,000, like this is a miracle. <laughs> <clears throat> so the lessons are, are, are vital at 10 years old, which gives you the freedom as a 65 year old. So they're actually quite connected too. Okay, I'll let you answer this one. Would you spend money to make a friend happy even if it meant not meeting a personal savings goal? Oh. Well, seeing as how I don't set goals, uh, yeah, I would I would probably tend to spend money to make a friend happy. Um, I wouldn't put myself in harm's way. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't spend to make friends happy to the point where it put my me in trouble. So maybe that's kind of what the question's getting at. I would I would selfishly put my myself and my family before making a friend happy with money. Uh, but practically speaking for myself, because I don't really set savings goals, whether that's a good thing or not, we'll, we'll find out in, you know, 30 years. Um, but yeah, in, in, in real life, if I was making a choice between saving some money away or, you know, taking a paying, paying for dinner, if I'm out with a friend or something like that, I would probably choose to make the friend happy. And there's a selfish motivation there too. Not that this is why I would do it, but, um, doing stuff like that tends to make you the person giving the money also much happier. Yeah, I would do it responsibly. I agree with you. It's interesting your comment about not having savings goals. 
And so many people we see that are financially independent later in life, so many times it comes from day in, day out habits that in many cases did not have defined goals through the years. It's just, you saved, you live below your means. Yeah. I, 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 we've talked about this before. I have habits. I just don't mandate, yeah. like, I'm going to save exactly this much, even if I make lifestyle sacrifices for, for doing so. I think I still save responsibly. I think I'm a reasonably good saver, but I also like doing stuff that costs money sometimes. <laughs> okay. That was good. Uh, quickly, bad advice of the week comes from Matthew. Sent it to me on Twitter. We shipped him off a hoodie. So it was in the June 17th article in Advisor Perspectives called Can't Decide Between Gold or Bitcoin? Why not both? <laughs> there we go. So Paul Tudor Jones, who's a billionaire hedge fund manager and philanthropist, is super bullish on Bitcoin right now and may give crypto the same 5% weight as gold, commodities, and cash in his portfolio. Two years ago, we said that gold was his favorite trade in the next 12 to 24 months. And of course, the yellow metal has had, and I quote, everything going for it and has surged 55% since that statement. So this week he made a similar call, I guess, and said he'd go all in and not just gold, but also crypto and commodities. And he called these, and this harkens back to our conversation, what, two weeks or four weeks ago on inflation. These are inflation trades. So put 5% into each of these four items, gold, crypto, commodities, and cash. Then Ray Dalio is also quoted in the article as saying he prefers Bitcoin over government bonds, which are, quote, stupid. The article goes on to say that many investors may not be able to afford to shun gold and Bitcoin. And of course, a simple 80-20 index of metals and cryptos has beaten the index, uh, the NASDAQ 100 index, since August 2017. Did you know that? The, the old 80-20 portfolio. 80-20 <laughs> portfolio of metals and crypto for the past four years has beaten the NASDAQ 100. Volatility is relative, and when combined with gold, Bitcoin has less risky than the S&P 500, which could sustain, could sustain the quasi-currency outperforms of 2021, says a Bloomberg commodity strategist. Hmm. There you go. 5% in each of those for you. Yep. I, I mean, it's probably bad advice, but I don't know. You know, gold's been kicking around, bouncing around up and down in price for quite a while now. Bitcoin could do the same thing. And maybe combining them together in a portfolio is good. Maybe you get a little uh, rebalancing elf in there. I don't know. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I think the I tried to really understand the Bitcoin argument. Like I tried to really understand it. I, I talked to someone who, who's very passionate about it and who I believe to be very intelligent. And I really tried to dig into the, the, the arguments. And I think it came down to, it comes down to this uh, view of economics where hard money is a requirement for a sound economy. And gold has at times been used as as hard currency or gold backed currency and this view states that we need to get back there and if that's true i actually agree that bitcoin is a very elegant solution uh, rather than gold um but i don't agree at all that we need to go to back go go toward having a hmm. hard hard money uh a, a constrained money supply but that, that's my understanding at this point is that the the bitcoin evangelists hold that belief that the, the future requires hard money and bitcoin is an elegant solution if we if we go in that direction but then it becomes a bet on whether or not the world is going to agree that we need to move in that direction and why you know there's a, a survey that university of chicago does uh, for their global markets initiative where they survey, you know, it's the top economists in the world. And this was about gold, but they asked if, I can't remember what the exact question was, but it was related to uh, w would gold be a better system or gold-backed currency be a better system? And 
I believe it was every single one of them in the survey said no with a high degree of confidence associated with their with their answer. I'll, I'll try and dig that survey up in hmm. the show notes because it's very, very, uh, it's very interesting. Anyway, so I, I really try to get it. <clears throat> and that's my current understanding of the, of the evangelism, that we need hard money and Bitcoin is the answer. And even then, there's a paper from a guy named um, Eric Budish at University of Chicago. He wrote a very compelling paper on the, uh, the economic limits of Bitcoin due to its uh, due to the way that it functions. Uh, we can post that paper too. That's uh, the, the people in, uh, in our community that, that are Bitcoin evangelists because there, are, there is a cohort in there. Um, they might appreciate reading through, uh, reading through that paper. Anyway, I didn't expect to go down this Bitcoin <coughs> rabbit hole at the end of our discussion here, but I spent a bunch of time on it a couple of weeks ago and came out with some interesting nuggets. Neat. Anything else? Uh, no, I think that's good. Though. Like we said at the at the top of the show, if uh, if you enjoy the podcast, leave us a review. We will read it. We will read it out on the podcast for everybody else to hear, and uh, it might help somebody else find the find the podcast. If you're one of the number of people that listen to this first thing Thursday mornings, thanks for listening and happy Canada Day. Should be a good day. That's right, happy Canada Day. And I'm and I, I'm sorry for not wearing a red shirt. I'm very proud to be Canadian. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Thanks for listening. <laughs>